welcome to another episode of the Chinese History Series on Carl Jaa's Silk and Steel podcast. I'm his co-host JJ, and uh, we will be going once again. This is the podcast series that talks about Chinese history from the deepest antiquity to what we hope, optimistically, will be the present day、um, at some point. So, joining us from no, momentarily not in Jungle of Bali anymore. Is, I give you a call job. Thank you, JJ, for that lovely intro. As always, one thing I'm glad I came to United States for September 22nd, just two days ago, the Chinese blockbuster Creation of Gods Part One, Kingdom of Storm, was、uh, premiered in North America. As far as I know, by AMC Theater, because I know AMC Theater was acquired by Chinese corporation Wanda, and ever since. AMC has been bringing Chinese movies over to North America to the cities that have large concentration of Chinese population.、Uh, so I was lucky. I, I took my family to watch. I always wanted to see in movie theaters. So I'm gonna make this episode a movie review slash history. We have been doing this his Chinese history chronologically series for a while now. You know, we, we started from. The deepest antiquity, all the way up to about five hundred, where around like five hundred forty-five BC. Now we're gonna travel back in time a little bit. We're getting our time machine because the movie Creation of Gods is actually based on a Ming Dynasty novel, a fantasy novel, but the setting is set at the collapse of Song Dynasty. You know, one of the earliest Chinese dynasties. So I thought this would be a perfect opportunity for us to talk about the movie itself, but also to talk about the actual history of the Song Dynasty. We covered the Song Dynasty in our previous episode. There have been new archaeological findings I would like to share with people. Let's first talk about the movie. You you just saw the movie、uh, yourself today. Uh, how, how did you like it? Yeah, a few hours ago, I liked it a lot. The content they incorporated a lot of historical detail in our Shang Dynasty episodes into the movie. So it starts with the future king、uh, Zhou of、uh, Shang. He's not king yet. He's not even crown prince yet. He is leading his father's armies against a rebellious lord in、uh, Jingzhou. This is. I don't recall suddenly which direction this rebellious state of Jingzhou is. Ji Jingzhou is in the north. I mean, people can tell by the setting; it's in like very snowy background. Almost look like their city wall is made of ice, like the wall in the Game of Thrones. I, you know, one、mm-hmm. thing about strike me about the movie: it's Chinese mythology, but done in a way、uh, with the Lord of the Ring aesthetics. They obviously hire some talent from Hollywood to you know use some of that Hollywood technology and know how. And and a lot of people mentioned it has a very this movie have a very、uh, Lord of the Ring feel, and I, I, I agree. And I, I think it fits actually. If if it fit very well, director, the producer, they all done their homework. They actually did historical research. I was very impressed because I watched the movie. I watched for the costume. I watched for the set. There are places where,、um, you know, they actually done their homework into、uh, archaeological finding of the Song Dynasty. You mentioned the the, the beginning of the, the the movie where the future. Last king of Song, he led the the army to attack this、uh, rebellious lord of the north. This particular piece recorded in the historical document about the Song Dynasty much later in the Warring、uh, Warring States period, because this 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 particular campaign will lead to the introduction of a very important character in the novel, the Fox Spirit. Daji in the novel originally, Daji was a princess,、um, you know, a daughter of this lord who was kind of vassal state to the Song, and she was presented as a tribute to the Song king. But she,、um, but half before she was about to marry off, something happened. And this in the original novel, the last king of Song already ascended to the throne. He went to the temple of Liuwa. Liuwa is like the the goddess of creation in the Chinese mythology. She is actually who made the humans out of clay in one version of the story, right? 
Yes, yes. So, so f according to the Chinese uh, or, or Orthodox Chinese historiography, the history began in China with the San Huang Wu Di, the three emperors and three sovereigns. And among the three emperors, the first two is Lü Wa's husband Fu Xi and Lü Wa herself. And Lü Wa herself is uh, a very powerful. She was credited with creating the humankind on earth. There was a temple dedicated to Lü Wa in the Song Dynasty, uh, according to the novel. And the son, the last king of Song, went to the temple, and he saw the statue of the goddess Lü Wa, and the statue was so lifelike. He became enamored of the statue, <laughs> and then he wrote a pornographic poem on the on the wall of the temple. Very sacrilegious act. So that really pissed off the goddess Miwa, and he she decided to send uh, punishment to the Sun Realm. And her agent for this uh, punishment was a fox spirit. Uh, so the fox spirit then. He took the opportunity to possess the princess Daji, who was sent to the Sun Court to be, you know, a concubine, and 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 but but the but somehow the Daji, the fox spirit, kind of you know Liwa kind of lost control of the, the the fox spirit she unleashed, and the fox spirit became kind of just starts gradually taking over the Sun Dynasty. But the movie presents a very kind of like a like a different version. Uh, which I like because you know, one one of the, go ahead. I think this the novel's version can. I was not surprised it's not adapted because I don't think it can get past censors <laughs> for like you know too much nudity <laughs> and the pornographic content. China China watcher may Western China watchers may seize on this point as sign of the like cultural authoritarianism. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that that's funny because. Back in the 1980s, uh, China, before I came to the United States, actually, they actually did made a series about uh, based on the novel. And but the series was pulled like before it will finish air. And it, it, even in the introduction, in the in the first like uh, the, the beginning of the of the TV, you know, they have the show credits and all that. There was a scene where they show nipples. <laughs> they had nipples showing uh, because by fact that in the nineteen eighty, <laughs> because in the nineteen eighties was a time when, uh, you know, China was starting to its a op opening and reform period. Social more is much more puritanical. Yeah, it, it was a it was a period where there's a lot of experimentation. There was a lot of experiment, like China started opening up. In, 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 in many ways, you know, both like opening up to the outside world, but also loosening up a lot of the restrictions you previously had, um, like, you know, TV production, etc. So, so a lot of the directors were pushing boundaries. So, you know, <laughs> so we're like, so there, so there was a bit of a nudity in that series. And that series was, was actually aired on CCTV, which is the China's national television broadcast all over China. So like after you air about 10 episodes, finally before some, some uh, I guess some upset censors find out and they're like, <laughs> they pull the series. So it would it never show like the full, uh, so you can still find the first 10 episodes online. Um, you know, maybe I'll post a link to the first 10 episodes. Uh, and, but but it they made it like a they also made it into like a scary movie type of thing like it's very more more creepy and more scary um and and the people people who don't know Chi China they don't have a rating system you know they don't have like PG rated G or PG thirteen or or R because just assuming that if the movie was released. You you know anybody can see it, including parents bring their children. Yeah, yeah. So that that's another reason why the Chinese, uh, yeah, yeah, Chinese sensory system is a little bit different from the West. You know, it's basically assume that the movie should be G rated G, like everybody, even little kids can watch it. <laughs> so 
because a lack of a rating system in China. But back to the to the to the movie itself, the story of Daji, not the fox spirit, but the historical Daji, was actually only mentioned almost 800 years after the fall of Song Dynasty in the Warring States period documentation. It mentioned that the king of Song went to attack uh, this uh, this this state called Su, and that's where he acquired the daughter of the Su chief, Daji, which was presented in the movie version. I just wanted to introduce the political landscape of the Song Dynasty. You know, in the in the traditional reading of the the, the early Chinese dynasties, uh, people tend to assume like the establishment of like centralized bureaucracy like later Chinese empires but it was actually not not the case um in the in the early Chinese documentations talking about the antiquity you talk about antiquity as one bang lin li or um, a world where 10,000 states all coexisted among the 10,000 states you know some powers start to emerge stronger and establish their hegemony and the Song kingdom the Song empire was emerged out of this environment so there were a lot of other independent centers of culture and ex coexisted with the Song. we discovered that through archaeological findings more recently so for example in the 1980s they dug up san xin Dui bronze age uh, civilization in the sichuan basin and that's when people realized holy crap there's a whole different civilization a bronze age civilization that existed in a different part of China that was previously unknown. And, and it's very obvious that San Xindui culture is very distinct from the Song culture. And they, they were not under the political control of the Song realm. And in the, 1990, in the 1989, there was another um, Bronze Age culture that was discovered south of Yangtze River in the, in the present day Jiangxi province. Um, this is the area called uh, uh, the, the particular archaeological site is called Da Yangzhou, um, Xingan Da Yangzhou, and and it's related to what l later the historians call the Wu Chen culture. The Wu Chen culture is south of Yangtze River, again in an area that's not under political control of the Song Dynasty. Yet they have a rival Bronze civilization. In fact, they discovered the Da Yangzhou. Ruin was dated older than the, the last Song Dynasty capital at Anyang. The discovery of Song Dynasty capital was a very big news in 1920s. And, and there has been a lot of digging around that. Uh, the, as I mentioned before in our Song Dynasty uh, episode, the Song Dynasty actually moves their capital around many times. But uh, for the last couple hundred years, they, they settled in the place called Anyang, Yinxu. And and that's where was that's the place that was discovered in in 1920s. But Yinxi, the history of Yinxi from the time where the Song Dynasty is making its capital is about 3,300 years ago to about 3,000 years ago. So about a period of two to three hundred years. But the the the, the bronze the bronze civilization center that discovered south of Yangtze River that's about 3,300 years old. So it's it's older than Anyang. Than the, so, 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 I mean, like, it's obvious there were different Bronze Age civilization in China at, at the time, other than the Song. Um, and, and the Song world is a, is a bit different because the Song didn't have a centralized bureaucracy like later di imperial dynasties. So they have a, like a kind of feudal system. They have, they subjugated a lot of the surrounding polities making them their vassal states but there's also like their enemies all around so so this is kind of uh, reflected by the opening shot of the movie where one of the lords is supposedly rebelled against the Song rule and the the prince of Song, who be, later became the future Song king he just led his army north to subdue this rebellion course he succeeds and this is where, where they also introduce the concept of the hostage the hostage prince oh, because the to ensure the loyalty of its uh, subjugate subject 
vassal states. The Song demanded these uh, its vassals to supply their uh, their their sons to serve as hostage in the Song capital. This actually, this tradition actually carried on beyond the Song dynasty, carried on to the Zhou dynasty, um, as we have talked about. Uh, you know, many of the Zhou vassal states also sent their um, sent their sons, sometimes their heir, uh, their crown prince, to serve as a hostage in the royal court, and that would even carry on to the later the spring autumn period. We we discussed that instance where state of Qi, in order to appease the hegemon, the state of Jin, state of Qi's crown prince was sent as a hostage to serve in the Jin court. The movie yeah. also wants to show through the different manner of dress of people from these different from these uh, vassal uh, polities is that there's no the there isn't any uh, common elite culture yet in China that comes with Zhou Dynasty when uh, the former Shang vassals their leader their elites get replaced by either Zhou relatives or Zhou or other noble families from further west who have been intermarrying with the Zhou for a long time and then you from there you get this common elite culture which will eventually gradually filter its way down downwards to the pleb level and you have some kind of common group identity of central plains people start to emerge but at this time when this shang army goes to fight north goes north it's like these guys like these gigantic guys in furs with like you know the hair out like this and the gigantic beards they look like very different people yeah yeah that's a good point because uh, uh even in the novel itself uh, there's four what they call Woho, and they're basically four vassals of the Song in each direction. There's one in the north, there's one in the east, one in the west, and one in the south. And in the in the movie they decided to make like uh, distinct appearances and distinct color associated with each of these vassals, uh, each of these people. So in the north they wear fur and their their coloring I think is gray. And in the West, where the Zhou come from, the, the Zhou are the lords of the West. And the Zhou, they were wearing the earthly yellow because they're, they're located in the Lo Losis Plateau, where it's, it's a literally yellow earth. In the South, the, the, their color is red. And in the East, their, their color is blue to reflect their, um, you know, the, the fact that they live in the coastal regions that border the ocean. Um, they, they talk about in a separate documentary about the making of the creation of the gods. So I thought that was nicely done. That, that was uh, that was nicely done. And they have a, they introduced the, the hostage system where all the all the vassal states sent their sons to be uh, taught and educated in the Song court. And apparently that's where the the, the prince of Song um, cultivated them into make them into this elite army corps whose loyalty is to the sound but mostly to himself as as their commander um and, and there was a very important scene well i guess this is where we're gonna get into a little bit spoiler but but this is like very at the very beginning of the movie so i, I don't think it matters much but this is cool. so i think we can say that uh, this is not going to this is not going to be spoiler free podcast. It'll be difficult to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From 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 this point onward, <laughs> if you plan to watch the movie and if you don't know the story, uh, yeah, most of the Chinese people, you know, when they grow up familiar with Chinese culture, they kind of grew up with stories. They say, "Do okay." The, the the big spoiler is Song Dynasty is gonna fall. Right, <laughs> that is a you know the, the last Song King of Song is gonna get overthrown. <laughs> this is the biggest spoiler that's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but you know that's that's why I was pleasantly surprised because this story is so well known in China. I was interested in how can they bring it out in like uh, still grab your audience interest. Um, but I think they did did that very well. They 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 make made some some uh, their own interpretations and they made it so it's still fresh the story is still fresh even though you kind of know the story you kind of know who's gonna win <laughs> you know you know the Song dynasty is gonna fall and uh and i think they did a good job so so now now the spoiler free section is over <laughs> now we're going to the 
to talk about the movie itself. I, I thought that was very well done to talk about the hostage system, the hostage of the of the different princes. I thought that was uh, a, a, like a nice touch to make the, the Sun King this very charismatic figure. He talked about, a lot about loyalty, a lot about duty. A lot of these young princes who serve as hostage actually look up to him as a, like a father figure. According to the record of grand historian Sima Qian, the last king of Song is actually a very talented young man. He grew up very intelligent uh, and uh, and have possessed in possession of great strength. Um, you know, one of his, uh, you know, one of the qualities that led his downfall is because he's so he excel in so many fields that he has a large hubris. You know, he thought he knew the best because he, in many cases, he was the best. Um, and and I think in the in the movie it did that did come through. And you know, they they chose um, Chinese American actor Philip Chris Philip to play the king the role of the king uh, Zhou uh, because um, for for people who who don't know the background of Chris Phillips, so Chris Phillips is. Uh, uh, he's Chinese American. His his father, I think, was with the American military that was stationed in Taiwan during the Cold War. That's when, after the Korean War, CIA flooded Taiwan with like American military advisors. Um, and, and at one point, you know, there sixty thousand American troops rotated from Taiwan through Taiwan during the Vietnam War. So, so Chris Phillips' dad was kind of part of that movement, and that he met his mom. Uh, you know, who recently came from mainland China in Taiwan. And, you know, that's how Chris Phillips came about. So in 1987, um, at the time when the martial law was finally lifted in Taiwan, when the you know people in Taiwan were allowed to go visit mainland, Chris Phillips with his mother went back to mainland China to see his grandma, you know, who they haven't seen forever and and he was chris phillips was already a star in taiwan like a little kind of teen heartthrob uh singer but he was invited to perform at um the cctv spring festival gala in 1987 and he did um and he did this uh, and he did this like kind of disco number like adaptation of a western song but was trans translated into Chinese but this this is the, the performance is something that people never seen before let me look it up on YouTube and I'll share it with people so people can see I hope I don't get into trouble with um with copyright <laughs> but we'll see maybe we'll just post this part only to my Patreon this is a clip that made Chris Philip like a household name in China in 1987 when he was like I think 27 or something. So he said, I am presenting this for my 100 year old grandmother uh, who is sitting at home in, in, in Sandong province. Oh, no way. That is his grandmother. I think he was giving it to his great grandmother, you know, 100 year old great grandmother that's sitting at home. So that's enough of that. In 1987, mainland China audience, nobody has seen anything like that before. Kind of like that disco dancing style. And he went gangbusters. Uh, I like he became like a like a overnight sensation. You know, Chinese aunties back then all want to all wanted to bone him. I mean, this is no secret. There were few, there were girls. There were like college girls writing like to him, say, I want to have your baby. <laughs> this was 1987 when China was still a very conservative place, you know, like, but, but he made women crazy. Like, you know, how uh, basically the effect that Elvis had when, when, you know, back in, back in the days. Uh, but then he, um, at the height of his fame, he decided to retire and went to Broadway to pursue his acting career. So after decades of Broadway, now this is his kind of the first debut on the Chinese film scene, um, uh, which like a lot of people, I'm I'm probably the last generation 
who remember him from 1987. 1987, I was like 10 years old. You know, people younger than me would know who he was. But, you know, a lot of the Chinese aunties, you know, who, who are not like Chinese grandmas would, would know, would remember him. He's fluent in Chinese, obviously. He created a, a very charismatic presence as the last king of, of Song Dynasty. Mm -hmm. Now the spoiler-free section is over. <laughs> now we're going to the to talk about the movie itself. So moving on in the story, he uh, he the king of victorious uh -huh. prince of Shang brings his army back to Zhao Ge, the uh, Shang capital, and he presents the uh, fox spirit banner of the defeated Lord of the North uh, to his liege. This uh, fox spirit a woman, they don't know, actually it's kind of, they, she's not identified as a fox spirit yet. Yet, What happens is that she's the last uh, princess of a Su, the Su clan. You know, she commits suicide uh, just as her last uh, family members are killed. And during the combat, the blood of this uh, Shang King drips down and uh, onto this uh, drum, I guess, and awakens this uh, fox spirit. And uh, she, so the next, you see the, the princess die, or well, she stabs herself, and uh, there's an avalanche, the, her carriage is buried, but uh, this woman, who seems okay, but her pe personality is a little off, uh, comes out. And uh, she, after some controversy among these uh, ho hostage prince commanders, uh, she's taken prisoner and presented to their commander, right, as a kind of gift. And he's thinking at initially to have her sacrificed uh, for the victory the next day, but then she shows an ability to heal his wounds by like licking them the way you know like dogs and <laughs> dogs and foxes and wolves you know, and, and cats they treat their wounds this way. <laughs> you know, the and so he keeps her around and presents her as a, he didn't it's actually kind of ambiguous he presents the banner of the defeated lord to his liege and she's in it at the celebratory dinner the uh existing crown prince who's uh, this prince of shang's elder brother suddenly gets goes crazy stabs his the actual king who's a very old geriatric man at this point and gets into a scuffle with the hostage sons who are performing a martial dance and i like this martial dance a lot because it it gave this a much more like militaristic bronze age tribal society feel yeah so this elder prince uh he's uh, who's the regent i guess he's the uh, de facto regent for their dad who's kind of out of it uh, even before he got he got stabbed he lunges at the uh, Prince of Shang and uh, the Prince of Zhou, who's one of these hostage uh, son's commanders, put in, gets in there and uh, stops the uh, elder prince from being able to stab, his, stab uh, Prince of Shang, his commander. And it seems that by fluke accident, he has uh, just killed, the guy killed himself. And the Prince of Shang pardons um, his subordinate because technically, you know, killing, uh, causing the death of, you know, royal family of Shang is a big deal. But he, his, the Prince of Shang pardons him, says, no, you did a good thing. The, you know, everyone saw that he tried to kill, he, he killed his, the king then this uh, Prince of Shang assumes power. And I didn't actually catch this at the time. The girlfriend, my girlfriend who was watching the movie with me <laughs> saw it, but the Prince of Shang, the elder Prince, his eyes flash uh, at an earlier point after he sees uh, Da Ji. And so he's like possessed in a way. And this is the effort, this is a plot by uh, future King Zhou and uh, Da Ji uh, to, for him to take power because she she gets herself spared after her capture, not only by licking the guy's wounds, but by saying, I can, prom I can make, give you what you actually want, which is the uh, 
to be the supreme ruler. I did not catch it the first time when, uh, you know, the, the fox spirit opened her eyes and that somehow bewitched the crown prince of Sang. But later in the movie, they make it more mm-hmm. explicit. They make it more explicit where there's a flashback where um, I think it's mm-hmm. the part where uh, Dachi was performing a dance mm-hmm. and then she was making the same movement that the crown prince yeah. was making during the banquet before he went crazy and stabbed the, the king. And so so if you miss the first time, which is yes. kind of subtle, uh, you know, the, the second yes. time they, they, they do a callback and make it more explicit, it was Daji, in fact, that possessed yes. the, 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 the crown prince of Sang to, to, kill, their, uh, to kill their father yeah. that gives the throne to... Um, to the the second son, you know, his her captor, and the uh, uh, so the 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 big departure from the book, you know, of course, the book originally Dachi was sent as a punishment by the goddess Nuwa, right, to 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 visit punishment on the Sun King, but here uh, the the fox spirit was kind of released by accident. It was because the the blood of Prince of, then Prince of Sang released the curse which is had sealed her in inside the stone. She felt grateful. Uh, she was trying to save her own life, but she also f- kind of felt grateful to this young prince who freed her. In the novel, Daji was primary agent to cause the 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 last king of Sang to act the way he is, like a, like a total tyrant. But whereas in the movie, they make it more like Daji is just a mere facilitator. She gives him extra powers. Let him do what he already wanted to do. Yes, yes. That's a big difference because, you know, you, you make it clear. Yeah, this is kind of a meta point in the story because in a way, the most of the character, the, the, the new crown prince, the son of this uh, king of Zhou and his best friend, who is the prince of uh, the king of Shang, king of Shang, and the, his friend, the uh, prince of Zhou, they are convinced that the king of Shang is righteous, okay, and that those who are opposing him uh, are doing out of nefarious for nefarious reasons. And once they realize something is off, they attribute it to this woman, this Daji, because the son the, the crown prince sees at the fox spirit at one point like eating like a person basically and so he pursues it into the imperial palace into his father's quarters and he sees that she's there and if the whole point the him and the future the character Fa, who will become the future king of Zhou, he they are convinced their commander is the king of Shang, he's basically fine and that he's bewitched uh, by this fox spirit. And they are trying to think of, you know, what can I do to uh, reveal this? And in the end, it's re- it's uh, sh- after they've gone through all this trouble, it's revealed that, no, like, you know, a guy, the, the, the king of Shang, he kind of doesn't care. It's, he was really, this was all, all that he did, he was wanting to do anyways. And the and spirit is just there to facilitate. Makes makes the job easier. So in a way, those characters like they are they are seeing it through the uh, through like traditional narrative, and you know the and then we get that traditional narrative subverted. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Young Crown Prince of Sang uh, and Prince of Zhou, uh, they were looking at kind of like a fresh, innocent eyes, delivering that traditional narrative that Daji, the mm-hmm. evil fox spirit, bewitched the last king of Sang. In, in in fact, it was the last. King of Sang, by nature, he was evil. He was ambitious and he would, you know, his desire was so boundless that he would go after what he wants, no matter what the cost. I I think that was done very well Mm because at at the end, there was a big revelation moment for the two princes. They realized, oh my God, (laughs) this man they look up to, this father figure, their father, uh, they always look up to as the you know the this righteous man was is actually mm-hmm. in fact evil. That's where it bring an uh, end to the first part mm-hmm. of the movie. So this this movie is part of a trilogy, just like Lord of the Rain. This is part one. Um, and it, it, the, the, it sets up the conflict. It sets up the conflict. The Lord of Zhou, uh, and and then in order to save 
like in the uh, in his inaug in his coronation ceremony, I liked the uh, the scene of the King of Shang's uh, usurpers kings uh, coronation ceremony a lot because it makes reference to the Shang people's uh, creation myth that we talked about earlier. How it was some great giant black bird that you know laid an egg that some woman swallowed and then she gave birth to a uh, uh, Shang progenitor. So that's like you know, all being recited during the ceremony. And then they do this, uh, or they are divining the future from. Uh, and the head priest is the king's uncle. And he, uh, and suddenly the you know, sky turns dark and the divination turns very, uh, goes very badly. He diagnoses this as well. The reading from the divination is that you, this, there's been a usurpation and a breaking of severe taboo when son kills the father. And I think, I think he actually said brother kills a brother as well. And I guess that is also another earlier hint that the king, that this king of Shang was behind, the, was behind the, uh, his brother killing the king and then manufacturing death. Because, he's, because his behavior is also very weird during that scene. He's just sort of sitting there, like totally calm, like while all this pandemonium is going on. And then you, you get this divination uh, result showing, you know, the gods are not, have not been fooled. Uh, by his tricks, and uh, yes, and then you have uh, this. You have a second divination result that is from when the Duke of Chou and the three other dukes they are on their way to the capital to you know pay homage as required to the new king. The Duke of Chou is known as a diviner, and uh, he gets similar results. And the and these guys are all like these four dukes are all uh, discussing how it's a sort of natural part. The, the divination of Song Dynasty was done very well with a turtle shell placed over an open flame. This is actually how the oracles were performed at the time. They will write um, kind of different question to the gods about you know whether they should take this next course of action. And then they pr put they, they, they put that writing either on turtle shell or the spatula of a cow bone, of a cow spatula or pig spatula, because the spatula bone is flat, it's easier to carve. And then they, after, then they place it open, open flame. And depending on how the bone or the turtle shell gets cracked, the, the oracle performs the interpretation. This is where how the oracle bone script gets discovered, because uh, like back in 1899, a uh, we talked about this in our previous episode, a, a Chinese scholar, a, a scholar gentry purchasing for Chinese medicine in the Beijing uh, medicine shop, he, he, he purchased all these bones that was used for making of traditional Chinese uh, medicine. And he, he discovered there's some kind of writing on the bone. 